Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. That's Courtney over there and I'm Brianna. Hello. So before we get started, the first thing that Courtney wants to tell you about is our social media. Where can they find us? You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and email. You can email us. It's true. What else are we on? <laughs> We're everywhere, everywhere. at it. Murder Dictionary. At Murder Dictionary If you podcast. look up Murder Dictionary, we're the only things that come up. Because really, who else is Murder Dictionary, right? Nobody. It's pretty unique. Yeah? Very unique. So, um, yeah. Follow us on there if you want updates on breaking news, if you want memes, if you want episode updates, all that kind of good stuff. We also have links in our show notes to the resources that we use to research if you want to do a little bit more reading. And also, we put in links to mental health resources, domestic violence resources, anti-bullying, a bunch of stuff like that if you need those kind of resources. And in the show notes, we put links to our merch store, which is Threadless. So if you want to go to threadless.com slash murder dictionary, you will find some shirts, phone cases, towels, you know, bags, everything you need with us all over it. Fun stuff. We, there's softball shirts too. You can design your That's own colors. Literally my favorite. It's pretty cool. I love those baseball shirts. Me too. It's my thing. And... Lastly, if you want to join our Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash murder dictionary podcast and get some bonus episodes and ad free episodes as well. So we've got a few new people that joined Patreon that we want to say thank you to. So thank you to Sarah, Kate, Bristol, and Amanda for joining our Patreon. Thank you, patrons. We appreciate you. So much. So, yeah, it's awesome to have new Patreons every week. So I appreciate you guys. And if you want to join, again, it's patreon.com slash Murder Dictionary Podcast. And I think that's pretty much it. We can jump into the case that we have for this week. We're still talking about musicians and music for letter M. And today... We've got the case of Christina Grimmy that most people know from The Voice or from YouTube. I always think she was on American Idol, but it's The Voice. Yes. This was like a season after I checked out of The Voice. I think I watched like the first two seasons, maybe, and then I was done. So I never really got to see her perform other than like, oh, there's a girl on The Voice you should see. It's really good. Right. But I wish I'd seen this season. Yeah. Yeah. I watched clips of it later, but she's very good. So Christina Victoria Grimmy was born on March 12th, 1994 in Evesham Township, New Jersey. Her mom, Tina, was a receptionist and her father, Albert, worked at Verizon. Her family had really strong Christian faith and they attended Fellowship Alliance Chapel in Medford, New Jersey. They were reportedly just very active in their church and each of them individually like would display a lot of like faith and talk about God a lot. It was a very big part of their lives. At around six years old, Christina began showing a talent for singing. Her parents, of course, wanted to encourage her musical talents, so they put her in piano lessons but after a while, she just began playing by ear. That is one of the most impressive things. If you ever get to see someone who can just play by ear, to watch them play the piano, it's awesome. Yeah, it absolutely is one of my favorite things. I'm really jealous no, me of too. those people. Well, first of all, one, let's start with I love the piano. And two... I love anyone that can really play well, but then there's this extra level of playing by ear. In high school, I I knew um, Mike Shinoda from Lincoln Park. Oh, him? And he was the very first person that I had met that could just really play by ear in a way that was like the most Im impressive thing I'd ever seen. He was doing all kinds of music, but at the time, like you could just name a song and he'd like think of the melody in his head and just start playing it. It was amazing. I'm really glad you told me this because I hate Linkin Park. 
<laughs> and like a lot. <laughs> and you telling me this actually makes me like, I have a little respect for them right now. No, no, he's a really talented he's a musician. musician. No, he's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. I, I mean, we um, like, all, you know, our group of friends or whatever, like went to their original signing party before they were even called Lincoln Park. I probably still have a copy of his demo tape on a cassette tape, you know, but that was the first time it was striking to me that I knew someone as a peer that could play by ear because you think of these musicians that are this talented and they're like next level, like you don't know anyone like that. He was the first person I saw in person just bust out songs by ear. And that's so amazing that Christina at so young could just play by ear, you know? I remember one kid that he could play by ear. We were at a party and everyone was like yelling songs out. I'll never forget this. He just all of a sudden looks up and goes, I saw the sign and starts <laughs> playing it like fucking amazing, right? Like we're like ninth grade. It was so fun. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's always impressive to me. I mean, just musicians in general, you know, of course, that's why we're doing M for music. But yeah, something where there's this little girl that's really young, she's a singer. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, she's not just a singer. She's someone who's a talented musician at a very young age, you know. Her parents, along with her brother Marcus, had to encourage Christina to kind of come out of her shell to perform because she was naturally very introverted. She had talent, but really didn't have the confidence, you know. Even though we're sitting here like, oh, my God, it's amazing. She didn't see that within herself yet. She was talented, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean she wanted you to know. Right. Yeah. It's a secret. Yeah. She's a wallflower, you know. Well, she also, it's kind of perfect that her family was super into church because this is a place where it's okay for her to, you know, play with her gifts and explore and see how it goes because she's just at church and so exactly. she's singing now. <laughs> it's kind of a safe space. Also, a lot of church performances are group ones. Yes. So even though some, you know, people may have solos or whatnot, it's a great environment for her to like hone her voice and her musical and talent in an ensemble in church. So it was definitely a big deal to her to have religion and to have music as part of her faith. Her brother Marcus played guitar, and his presence performing with her was often the thing that put her at ease on stage. They really often performed together because that was how she was most comfortable in the beginning. Christina listened to a lot of Christian artists, and her favorite was Stacy Orico. I didn't know that she was technically a Christian artist. Yeah, I mean, I think... She was just a pop singer. Yeah, she, me, was, but... she was a pop singer, but she, what she listened to when she was growing up was a lot of Christian music. Gotcha. But beyond that, she said her biggest vocal influence was Christina Aguilera, and she said her favorite singers were Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Beyonce, and Lady Gaga. Good company to be in. Yeah. I mean, come on. But she also liked dubstep, EDM, and rock bands like Tool, Pantera, and Metallica. That's right. She attended Bethel Baptist Christian School, Marlton Middle School, and Cherokee High School. But she was eventually homeschooled once her singing career took off. From a very early age, she was passionate about animals, and as she got older, she considered herself an animal rights activist. She would also volunteer and participate in fundraisers for the Humane Society. I wonder if she eventually would have done those, like, topless PETA with the tape. Right. right? That was PETA, yeah? The housewives did it. Might have been glad. What am I thinking of? I'm pretty sure that was like the no H no A campaign and stuff like. But I I hear what you're saying because a lot of the PETA things do the no fur and they do naked campaigns and then they dress all ridiculous with like feathers and they look like they're in a cage or something. Joanna Krupa from Miami Housewives. She did that. I'm sorry, everyone. I apologize. <laughs> How dare you get your celebrity campaigns mixed up? My nude celebrity campaigns. Yeah, she definitely would have been one of those stars that's featured. And later on, I mean, she becomes kind of known for this later, 
You know, it, it's just part of who she was, was just this person that's passionate about animals and animal rights. In 2009, when she was 15, Christina's friend suggested that she start posting videos on YouTube. And she thought it sounded like a good idea. So she started making cover song videos. The first video that gained some traction was her version of Miley Cyrus's Party in the USA in August 2009. And by 2010, she had 100,000 subscribers. That was fast. Yeah. I mean, really, it took off so quickly for her. And might I say, Party in the USA, I don't believe in guilty pleasures. It's just one of my banger ass songs. I think it slaps. I love that song. I was sitting here like, do I share this? (laughs) I love that song. Sorry, I just do. It's great. Yeah. Banger. Definitely. So it's a great, great song choice. And she was also known for that, like choosing really good songs to cover. And so that's why her videos were popular. People tuned in and they were like, oh, this is an interesting version of an awesome song I already like. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was her own spin on it. You know, it was great. Her cover of Nelly's Just a Dream with fellow YouTube star Sam Swee quickly racked up also over 100 million views. She was really just taking off. That's so many people. I know. The song would eventually end up on iTunes and Spotify. And in 2011, she would hit a million followers on YouTube. That year... She also competed in the My YouTube competition and almost won. But Selena Gomez took home the number one spot. It's a pretty awesome thing to say, though. I lost to Selena Gomez. Right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Is just like, I mean, if you're going to come in number two, obviously Selena Gomez has had some enduring star power. Like, yeah, that's a you're number two, but you're number two to someone that's very popular. You're still number one. Right. <laughs> So when this competition happened, Selena Gomez's parents, Mandy and Brian, took notice of Christina and they went on to become her managers. Christina joined the very first Digi Tour in 2011, which was created specifically to showcase YouTube artists. Afterwards, she went on to be the opening act for Selena Gomez, All-Star Weekend, and the Jonas Brothers. So again, she's had this YouTube success, but in her own right, she's really starting to take off. If you're the opening act for these large artists, I mean, that's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, that's a really pretty big accomplishment for someone who's a a teenager, you know? Uh, Securing... Opening acts for the Jonas Brothers and Selena Gomez at this time, you're good. Yeah. I mean, this is the golden era of those artists. Just I mean, they were at their peak. Yeah. Her first indie EP called Find Me came out on June 14th, 2011 and debuted at number 35 on the U.S. Billboard charts. It's great for an unknown. Honestly, for a YouTube Crazy. artist, like, I mean... And this was years ago. I know YouTube is, you know, much more prominent today. But I mean, at the time, this is almost 10 years ago. That's a pretty big deal just on the strength of YouTube and opening for other acts. That's a pretty large leap onto the charts, you know? It really is, especially because people like even 10 years ago, buying music was fading. Right. So even the fact that we have Billboard to talk about here, it's like the 60s and 70s, number one on Billboard, and that meant something, right? (laughs) Right now, it's like, oh, Billboard. The kids are like, what the fuck is Billboard? Yeah, (laughs) completely different game Dick Clark stuff. It's like old people shit, right? (laughs) In early 2012, Christina decided to move to Los Angeles to advance her career, and she joined CAA Agency. Another big move. Right, exactly. You have to kind of be somebody to be with CAA. When they moved to L.A., it was an especially difficult time because her mother was on chemo for breast cancer, which her mom would battle multiple times. It was a really difficult move for them. 
to go through during this specific time. But they supported her and, you know, it was just the right move for her to career, like, to do so. But it was a big sacrifice for everyone. By 2013, her YouTube had more than 375 million views and 2 million subscribers. And she released her debut album called With Love. On her videos, she was very vocal about her love for video games, especially Zelda. She was a huge fan. People love Zelda. Oh, yeah. My cousin named her dog Zelda. It's a big deal. Yeah. She wore a crown at her wedding because of Zelda, I think it was, too. Yeah, people are really into it. They had a Pokemon ball that they put the engagement rings in. Oh. (laughs) Let's continue. Her and her brother were both such big fans of Zelda that they got matching tattoos that read Player One and Player Two. And he often toured with her playing guitar and helping to manage her day-to-day activities. And again, this was one more thing that would just make her more comfortable and put her at ease. Her whole life, her brother was kind of that force for her. It helped her to be more comfortable on stage and her family encouraged her to like come out of her shell. So having him there was very helpful while she was getting bigger stardom. Although YouTube was good exposure, she knew it could only get her so far, you know, and she'd have to explore other methods of getting her name out there. And she was doing really well, but it, I think, felt like she was kind of peaking at this time. You know, like she was had this momentum and maybe plateaued and need to look for other avenues to really get more exposure. So in 2014, Christina made her debut trying out for season six of The Voice. And she sang Miley Cyrus's song Wrecking Ball for her audition. When she auditioned, all four coaches, Adam Levine, Usher, Shakira, and Blake Shelton, all turned their chairs around for her, and she chose to team up with Adam Levine. I was just showing Courtney a a video of The Voice from this week, and it's like, it's a huge deal to have a four-chair turn, because a lot of times you get one person, two people duking it out and being like, come to my team and blah, blah, blah. But when you see someone that's a four chair turn, it says a lot about how far they're most likely going to go in the competition. Because if they walk out and do their audition and they already have a great song choice, a great voice to match, and they're able to command the stage, it feels like they're already a little bit more seasoned and established and the judges are like all in on them. You know, they all want them on their team. It's like when in Shark Tank, they say, what kind of money you got in sales? And they're like, seven million dollars this year. And they're like, we'd like to make a deal with you. (laughs) Yes, Right. You don't get the for that reason. I'm out. With this person. Right. That's exactly, I mean, everyone saw her potential. When you see someone that's already bringing it, that's already got like the 7 million in sales, you know what I mean? If she's got these 250 million downloads and this amount of followers, even if you're doing the blind audition and the judges don't know that, you can hear that in her voice. You can feel it in her performance. You know that she's on pitch, doing the right runs, like everything that's needed to get far in the competition. So yeah, it was a big deal for her to have a four chair turn. And it's a big deal just in the voice in general for all four uh, coaches to turn their chairs, you know? Yeah, if she's playing by ear, she's got perfect pitch. This is what we call turnkey. You put the key in, you turn it, it starts the engine. It's perfect. It runs. You're good to go. Right now, many of us are spending significantly more time at home, and we're all looking for more content to fill our days. For me, Audible has everything I need to fill my social distancing time, from whimsical audiobooks if I need a pick-me-up, to updates from news outlets, and even Audible original content to keep my work-from-home hours entertaining. Right now, I'm listening to Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill about taking down Harvey Weinstein. 
between episodes of an awesome Audible original called The Dark Web. I'm trying to look at this crazy situation our world is in as the perfect time to learn new things, try the hobbies I keep putting off, and get through all those audiobooks I never seem to have the time for. That's why I'm happy to offer our listeners a 30-day free trial if you go to audible.com slash mdpod. If you've been thinking about signing up, now is the perfect time to get access to not only audiobooks, but all those Audible originals, podcasts, and daily news from outlets like New York Times and The Wall Street Journal. Just go to audible.com slash mdpod to get 30 days free. During her time on the show, Adam told Christina that she had the potential to be a, quote, huge star because of her voice and stage presence. Usher called her Baby Celine Dion, and Shakira described her high register as, quote, out of this world. So every single one of them was just so impressed by her. I mean, she was one of the breakout competitors of this year. During the competition, her fellow contestants gravitated to her initially because many of them already recognized her from YouTube. You've got to think about all the contestants being in the music world and, you know, watching each other on YouTube and whatnot. A lot of people knew what a big deal she was coming in to the competition. She was only 17 at the time of filming, so she was really struggling with homesickness. And the stress of the competition made her a bit more introverted. People described Christina as very sweet and goofy, but definitely she had a quiet, serious side and, again, a focus on religion. She started to lead worships with her fellow contestants while they were all sequestered in the hotel going through the competition process. From what I understand, I mean, they were in the hotel and couldn't really leave at all for weeks at a time, you know? They were just stuck there. And of course, Christina was just like, well, I can't get to church. So she just started making her own services. And other people that were religious just started joining in. It was kind of a cool, like, organic sort of faith group that emerged. That is pretty cool. It's like, you know. The original Sunday service. Right? Right. (laughs) <laughs> not yeah. asking for anything from anyone else, just doing what she believes in. Exactly. For the good of herself and others. Exactly. I mean, I think it's a very positive thing because people find so much solace and hope in their religion and their faith and their spirituality. So it's hard to go through this whole competition process. So I'm sure a lot of, you know, the contestants there really appreciated that someone was there you know, speaking that sort of language and exploring those concepts. And, you know, maybe they could sing some sort of hymns together. And like, it just, I don't know, it feels very hopeful. You know, religion may not be my thing, but I can totally understand what a comfort and a help and sense of support that you get by doing this in a hotel, like, while waiting for the voice, you know. So it was just something a lot of people remember It was very powerful, her presence and her faith. Ultimately, Christina finished third place, but host Carson Daly said that he was, quote, shocked that Christina didn't win. It seems like the general consensus, like people really thought she was going to take first. During the competition, her coach Adam said he'd want to sign her to his record label, 222 Records. It might be 222. I don't know enough about Adam Levine, to be honest. It's fine. Lil Wayne also expressed interest in signing her to Young Money Entertainment, but she ultimately chose to sign with Island Records. I think that's pretty interesting, by the way. And also with the whole drama between like at this time especially with Lil Wayne and Birdman and stuff with the label too right it's very interesting to me that he's like I'm gonna take on Christina Grimmie now like wait what 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 the hell's going on here because this was like tension 
high at this point. I think lawsuits were going back right now. Right. So, well, like, that may have been a factor in her not signing with them. Well, yeah. But it is also interesting that these different style of artists were all appreciating her voice, saying that they wanted to bring her on the team. You know, I mean, there was a lot of people seeking her out and recognizing her talent. Yeah. Once the medial blackout of The Voice was over and she could resume making videos and interacting with fans, she started to feel more normal again. The process of being isolated and doing The Voice was just really hard for her. Again, I mean, the doing the church services and that kind of stuff helped, but I mean, it was grueling for her, very isolating. In June 2014, Christina joined The Voice Summer Tour along with a handful of winners and runners-up from the show. Her older brother, Marcus, continued to support Christina on tour as her guitar player and road manager. I love that. Yeah, this whole time. I mean, I know I mention it multiple times throughout this, but it's just it's important to know what a huge part of her process he was. Just in making her feel at home, you know, and making her feel like it's hard for artists to perform at their full potential if they're just sad, lonely, don't have someone around that makes them feel comfortable, you know? This so, is also when you see the uptick in drinking backstage. Exactly. You start taking drugs because you're just bored and what else is there to do? I got to get through three nights of this. My back hurts. Let me take a pill. Right? Yep. That's how it starts. So this is where her brother comes in because it's like that's not going to happen when he's around telling her everything's okay. I love you. You're loved. Your fans love you. I'm here to support you. Just look at me on stage and you'll feel more comfortable like trying to just pump her up. This week I watched the documentary on Lil Peep and basically what you were just describing is how I feel about his death is just – really. The, all the people around him were just there to party and take advantage. Yeah. So like, yeah, of course, if you have a whole bunch of people that just want to do drugs and they want to do your drugs and they want someone to get high with and what, you know, like, of course, you're going to take too many drugs. If you don't have people around you that are like, look, just, you know, perform and be your best you and perform to your fullest potential and focus on the art, you know, if people aren't there really pushing you in that direction and reminding you how loved you are, then it is going to be about the partying. And when it's about the partying, you're more likely to, you know, stumble upon something that has fentanyl in it, you know? All the extracurricular is what totally takes the focus away from, like, the cause, like what we're doing here. Right. The and art, I, the, the just the creation, the process, the performances, it all detracts from that. And that's not to say that people, that artists that party hard don't have people that love them around them because that's absolutely not true. But it's just like having Christina having her brother, you know what I mean? Like a positive influence is different than having people that are just keeping you company, that their love is just based on being around you, you know? I feel like all of these, like, this is terrible how it sounds, but you get it. All these, quote unquote, like, lil overdoses, all these young kids, right? Like, the lil peeps and the lil these, right? I don't know how to explain this, but all of a sudden they all have lil in front of their name. Right. I checked out a rap, like, a couple of years ago. So I come in sometimes and go, who the hell are these people? Yeah. I don't get it. But it's clear to me that they are surrounded by yes men, all yes. these kids, because there's no reason for you to be owning a house in Sherman Oaks, having 30 people in it, ODing, and they're partying around your dead body. Right. Like, what the hell is going on here? These are yes men. These are people that are not about the cause. We definitely see this time and time again. Yes. Yeah. It's Lil Peep. It's it's Either Mac one. Miller. It's yeah, yeah. everything. He's the Sherman Oaks guy. So it, it is just like, you know, very lucky that Christina had so much support from her family and especially her brother, because it's so easy for someone that's so young, that gets famous so young and is doing these tours to just go in a different direction, you know, and even if everybody, you know, loves these musicians in their own way it's just not healthy a lot of the influence that they have and you're right the yes man thing it can really go on to cause extreme damage and 
great harm to people's lives. And you when know? the yes man wants something, they're going to find the rock doc and they're going to bring him. Like, yeah. it's always going to be that way. Yeah. Christina tried to stay grounded despite her newfound fame by still staying involved in her hobbies of gaming and working for animal rights as well as adopting a dog. Christina began working with PETA to promote pet adoption, and she received a leaf on PETA's Tree of Life, which honors heroes for animals. Adorable. In her free time, she was writing and recording songs for her next album. But unfortunately, she was dropped from Island Records about a year later. So she decided to release a few singles independently, and they performed pretty well. Christina became a contestant in the iHeartRadio Rising Star competition in May 2015, and she won the contest. Her prize was a spot on the lineup of the 2015 iHeartRadio Music Festival. On February 21st, 2016, Christina released her second EP titled Side A with four songs and said a second one called Side B would soon follow. She's on it because at this point, she's seeing the big picture. The studio system is dead. Or the studio system. <laughs> I'm talking about movies. The uh, label system in music is right. dead. It's a dying thing. You don't need a label anymore. Honestly, in order to be successful now, you need media, internet, right? And touring. Touring will always, it doesn't matter what you are, who you are, that will bring you an audience no matter what you do, touring. So for her to this be able- This is just Courtney trying to convince me to go on tour. That's what's happening right Let's now. Go. <laughs> what have we got to lose? We can record from the road. Right, guys? Like, come on. Um, but seriously, like, it's pretty, pretty awesome that the she... whole industry has changed. And yes. it, you're right. It applies to everything. It applies to podcasting. It applies to art. Movies. And Who goes to fashion. The movie you know, I mean, really, it does just require that you have a really intense and strong internet presence. Ambition. And that you're out there on the street. People are seeing you, seeing your work. You're right. So the combination of touring and continuing to put out music, even if it's not on a major label, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. And she recognized that and was just like, this is all I need to do. I'm making all my YouTube videos. I'm doing these cover songs. I'm making gaming videos. And I'm going to release my own music. Fuck a label. I mean, really, if you look at this, she reverts and she's making mixtapes at this point. That's right. what she's doing. She's just making mixtapes and touring, which is 101, how to spread the word on your name. This goes back decades. Right. And like you could say, she didn't come up with this. And oh, Selena Gomez's parents are managing her. But she's the one that started. She knew as long as I do it correctly, you know, the right media, the right audience, she's got this. And it's like she probably just told them this is what I'm doing. Right. And they're like, that's a great idea. We'll support you with this iHeartRadio Music Festival. We'll get you that. But like she had to get herself that too. Yeah, you're right. I mean, of course, she never was the one that came up with this formula. The industry has been moving in this direction for a minute. So she just, you know, recognized that like most other people and and did that as her tactic to yeah. really flourish and become successful. But at the same time, you're right. You have to have a certain amount of work ethic. You know, you have to have the talent to back it up. There's all those things. You could do all the road work and all the releases and mixtapes you want. But if you don't have the voice, the songwriting, and the work ethic to really keep grinding, I mean, you're not going to get very far even using the formula to its perfection, you know? So yeah, she really did have all of those components that you need. On June 10th, 2016, 22-year-old Christina was scheduled to perform at the Plaza Live in Orlando, Florida. It was the very last stop on her tour before she could return home to Los Angeles. Christina was the opening act, and the headliner was a local Orlando band consisting of three brothers, called Before You Exit. It's a weird band name. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you could say that about like 90% of bands, I think. I get it, but Before You Exit? 
<laughs> I mean, Radiohead was originally called On a Friday because they rehearsed on Fridays. So I'm just saying. There's a lot of shitty band names out there and they still become famous. I must have some sort of prejudice. So I was like, I can get down with on a Friday. But fuck before you exit. Like You're I have like, some I issue. Love Fridays. Like before you exit probably isn't that bad. Like an hour ago, I would have been like, that's a cool band name. <laughs> Look, Court, they can't all be <laughs> mega death. You know what I mean? There's only one. Like you- do you know what's the best? It's Dave Mustaine. He would pull into town and he they would be like, well, what is your name? And he'd be like, oh, well, my band is named Magadeth. And he would end up at like church groups explaining like Magadeth, right? And I just love that still. Megadeth, <laughs> don't even start. It's homegirl. Oh, that's your I met, shit. I met Dave Mustaine on my 16th birthday. Oh, my God. I got tickets from my boyfriend at the time from Rev and Kevin, who used to write a metal magazine review. Ooh. And so at the House of Blues, we stayed late. We got upstairs and I got to meet Megadeth, Dave Mustaine, Dave Ellison, all these fun things in That's the year amazing. 2000. <laughs> but really, like, I mean, they can't all have the most like I badass know. names, you okay. know, like there's a finite number, you know, of Fine. cool names out there. So before you exit, it is. And apparently they were pretty popular locally because they were an Orlando band. It was kind of a, a big draw, you know? This is why people hate me. Is because I'm just like, oh, I don't like this name. 20 minutes later, we're like, they were all right. <laughs> I met Megadeth. Continue. <laughs> the venue is a mid-sized theater that features acts that are kind of too popular for the bar circuit and those size venues, but not quite huge enough to fill a more substantial venue, you know? It's just... We all know there's just different kind of levels of venue. There's bands you see in bars, some you see at the Staples Center, you know? This yes. one's in between. So, palladium. Right. The Palladium. There you go. Yeah. Um, so security did some light bag checks that night, but they did not have metal detectors, nor did they frisk the concert goers. Which honestly is pretty usual as far as I'm concerned. My experience, I go to a shit ton of shows. And this is typical for mid-sized venues. I don't think this is anything out of the ordinary. And I don't want to say like, oh, they dropped the ball because everyone else does metal detectors. Because they don't. There's it's no not ball true. to drop. Right. This yeah. is just the way that the industry is. I mean, everywhere you go, House of Blues does the same sort of thing. You know, I mean, like... Anything. You just mentioned the Palladium, same sort of thing. Whatever it is, the Observatory, these are all pretty substantial venues in Los Angeles that really just do a very cursory bag check. Maybe might pat you down, but a very light pat down. This isn't TSA, you know? Definitely not. Audience members remarked that security was very lax and mostly concerned with people not bringing in outside food or drinks, which again is kind of typical. I feel like they want to see your bag. They want to see if you're dream- bringing in whatever, sneaking in some booze or some drugs or whatever, and that's it, you know? I've had people stop me for like medication, you know? Listeners know Courtney and I both have health issues. Like I've had people be like, okay, I need to see a prescription for this. I need to see your names on it or even over the counter medication. They think that I filled the bottle with some other, like I just put fucking Molly in there or something, you know? That's what I always get stopped for. But oftentimes that's what security is worried about. It doesn't feel like they're looking for weapons. It doesn't look like they're really assessing real threats. That's what I'm trying to point out. You know, they're looking for drinks and drugs. Correct. At 10 p.m. when the concert was over, Christina came out to do a meet and greet for about 100 fans waiting inside of the venue. At 10.24 p.m., a 27-year-old fan named Kevin James Loibel reached the front of the line for his turn to meet Christina. Kevin Louisville grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida, with mom Nora, dad Paul, and his brother, Chris, who was a few years older than him. He came from a very abusive home. His mom, Nora, broke his brother's arm, threw dishes at the kids, and even hit the kids with a frying pan 
Eek. It was horrific. That's not good. Socially, Kevin was an awkward, introverted child who became even more solitary as time went on. He had one friend named Corey Dennington, who he'd known since he was 11. But otherwise, he just isolated in his bedroom and really didn't have any friends. He covered his windows in foil and blankets and often wore earplugs or headphones because he didn't like loud noises. And to me, this really speaks of trauma, you know, of just like the chaotic household wanting just some peace and quiet and knowing that there's just this craziness going on around him with the abuse. So, of course, he's easily startled, you know, like. Of course, I'd be terrified all the time and be startled by loud noises if someone hit me with a frying pan. Of course. It just makes sense. I feel like there's more to this, though. Yes. That this is autism. You can't diagnose everybody with autism. So, but, okay, so cut whatever you want. But here's the thing. I know that in my experience, I've had people come up to me and say, where do you keep ear protection? I have a son who has disabilities, and because of it, loud noises affect him differently, and so we need headphones to do dot, 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 whatever that may be. And he wears them in the house, and he wears them all the time. It's sometimes, it's like a side effect, or a what's a, an expression of the disorder, if you will, is this uh, aversion to loud noises and just like, Clam up, tension, freak out with loud noises. That's not necessarily related to trauma, but I'm sure it applies here as well. I hear what you're saying. And there may might be a dual diagnosis kind of thing where it is trauma and he may possibly be on the spectrum. I definitely hear what you're saying. Yeah. That it, it's it, like the aversion to loud noises and needing the dark. The isolation. You know, and isolating one and friend, not having not a lot of along. friends. It's possible. But I think either one of those things, it could be attributed to trauma, you know, some sort of autism spectrum. It's or chicken both. or the egg. Yeah, well, yeah. Which we came just, first, you we know? We don't know. It's yeah. purely speculation. But you're right. That is an observation that it's like it's it may be possible. We don't know. But it was something that people always noted that like he really liked to isolate in his bedroom. He was really easily startled and scared of loud noises and just wanted peace, quiet, dark, alone time, you know? So, but you're right. It could, it could be that. It could be the trauma. It could be both. We don't really know. But definitely it's in every description of him, you know? His bedroom walls were bare. He didn't have pictures of anyone close to him. And he slept on a thin mattress that laid directly on the floor. He escaped the emotional turmoil of his home life by immersing himself in gaming. And he obsessively played World of Warcraft. I don't really know anyone that casually plays World of Warcraft, by the way. Can you think of one person? Because no. everybody I know that's like ever played that, it's just their entire life. It's like, oh, all I do is wow. That's I it. I just always remember like, and this goes for any like big video game when it first comes out. You just lose everyone you've ever known for like two months right. <laughs> to whatever this affliction is, whether it's wow or GTA once they call all decide duty, to hyphenate or whatever. Halo. It's <laughs> a everything. little thing they call it. Yeah, and and I hear what you're saying, but there's something very particular about the people that I know that have played World of Warcraft that that's not just a two month temporary thing. That's just like okay, there goes five this years is what of we're my doing life. Now. You know, I literally know two people that have moved across the country because they've met friends on World of Warcraft and became so close that they're like, oh, I'm going to go visit my WoW friends, and then they just move there. That's like. True story shit. So people are very into this game. And he is one of those people that was completely obsessed, played it constantly, just 24-7. Everything was about World of Warcraft. Is there anything that I'm that into that I would move? Let me think. I can't think of anything other than like cross-stitching is what I'm <laughs> into. Is like embroidery. 
The only thing I was thinking of is a relationship. Like, I, yeah, if yeah, I fell right. in love with someone across the country, I'd probably move. But at the same time. I live time, in Southern California. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Please. But yeah, that's a, it is a big decision. That's hysterical. Two people? You know, my God. Okay. <laughs> After high school, Kevin attempted to go to college and he was smart. But he had trouble with his math class, and he preferred, of course, World of Warcraft over doing homework. So he failed out of college because of video games. No. Uh, Yes, I'm serious. It just, it took over his life, truly. But this also speaks to, you know, uh, obsession, If you have an addictive, obsessive personality, this kind of is a sign of that as well. So it could be World of Warcraft. You could attach yourself to something else. You could get into drugs, like whatever it is. I think this is kind of a first sign of him having a very obsessive, addictive personality. Like if he got into Point Break, for example, would (laughs) he have like start, you know, would he be a surfer or would he have been a bank robber or a skydiver? Right. He's into these things. Yes. When college didn't work out, his best slash only friend, Corey, helped him get a job on the Geek Squad at Best Buy in 2008. Seems like a good match, right? It's a great match. His supervisor at Best Buy described him as detached and socially awkward with no social skills. In 2010, The situation at the Loibel home got particularly bad, and in a heated argument, 21-year-old Kevin told his mother to, quote, go ahead and do it when she was talking about killing herself. Oh. It was, yeah, it was really, really dark time. It's not what you're supposed to say when someone says that. Especially because a short while later... Nora did die of taking an overdose of aspirin. And Kevin, of course, blamed himself for her death because of that conversation. That's rough. It it was really awful. Even if you're a person who's like firing on all cylinders, you got a full time job, you got, you know, you, yeah. you fought it all together. If that happens to you, like you're spiraling, there's no way you can you can. A very healthy, well-adjusted person would completely fall apart if they went through this. So knowing that he already struggles so much to just maintain some sort of normalcy and a part-time job and, you know, it's very hard for him. So then going through this, I mean, he's just out of his mind. I mean, his world is shattered. A short while later, when his father began dating someone new... Kevin became extremely upset. There were a string of drunken altercations at the Loibo home, and the police responded to six domestic disputes over the course of two years. Do you know who was drunk? Were they all drunk? All of them. All three. So this is and drunken. In varying gotcha. states. You yes. know what I mean? So like, of you know, over the course of six calls, one time it may be Kevin, one time it may be the dad, one time it may be both, one time it may be the new girlfriend. Got you it. know, it was really a variation. So we know from this that Kevin is a binge drinker. Mm-hmm. We also know that, you know, drinking runs in his family, that this is a very emotional time. But it wasn't a case where every single time it's Kevin's fault and Kevin's drunk. No. And it it seems like this is a family that they probably have a history of fighting. It's Mm -hmm. just one of those families. You know, there's just families that like they just throw down. Like the brothers fight all the time. The mom and the dad fight. Like dad fights brothers. The brothers are out on the front porch and they've got the hose out and they're hosing (sighs) him down to get him to stop. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's that's the Loyal home. Some people just have that sort of dynamic. But I mean, you know, there's also a a history of abuse and dysfunction. It's not just like, oh, some families kind of fight or some families are kind of loud. You know, some families just kind of yell at each other like they don't hold back. They just get it out and then it's over. But the Loyal homes seemed to really escalate to violence. And it's important to point that out. They weren't just yelling and fighting. It was a really unstable, violent home. 
he was not safe. The fights were all between different combinations of people, including Kevin, his dad, and the new girlfriend. Although Kevin didn't necessarily have a criminal past, he had numerous run-ins with the police for many minor infractions. He was the victim of a battery case, he had a car accident, committed petty theft, and he was a suspect in an alleged aggravated battery. The battery charges were dropped after the victim said that she couldn't remember the incident and became uncooperative. In 2013, the police responded to a domestic dispute between Kevin and his father's fiance, Don. During the fight, Don had followed Kevin to his room, and he had slammed the door on her arm, which broke her wrist. He claimed that he was drunk and unaware that her arm was in the way when he did slam the door, that it wasn't on purpose that he was trying to hurt her. I tend to believe that. Yeah, I mean, I think he was just really that messed up that it just didn't register that her arm was in the way. The police report indicated that Don was also extremely intoxicated at the time, and no charges came from this incident. The following year, police responded to a domestic call in which Kevin's dad, Paul, and Kevin's dad's fiance, Don, were fighting. But again, there were no charges. It was just constant. Through all the chaos, Kevin still used isolation and World of Warcraft to cope. People say he reportedly lived, quote, like a hermit and only left his bedroom to go to work at Best Buy. He spent most of his time at home, alone, gaming, watching YouTube, and eventually obsessing over Christina Grimmie. Kevin had taken an interest in Christina because he was also into gaming like her and loved YouTube, So when he came across her, he was just instantly captivated by the talented and beautiful singer that had these commonalities with him. Not all people who play video games are crazy. No. But all crazy people are playing video games (laughs) is what I'm finding. And it's just safer to not do it. (laughs) Word feud. Slots. Video poker. (laughs) That's what you approve of? That's what I got. His best friend, Corey, said that he began spending most of his free time watching videos of Christina and looking at her social media. He told Corey that she had, quote, changed him, and he was convinced that they were meant to be together. And he would have a love story, just like his dad and Dawn. Right? Right. Like, what is the ideal here? Or his mother and his father. Yeah. I mean... Wow. Clearly, he doesn't really have a handle on what a healthy relationship looks like. So for him, obsessing over this person who's a stranger, I mean, maybe... No, they're going to get together and they're going to sit together alone and play video games. (laughs) Right, right. That's That's the dream for him. Yes, that's the dream. That's it. But he doesn't really have any like role model of what a relationship looks like. So it doesn't really strike me as odd that he would connect to someone that's a stranger yeah. because it's like he's having trouble connecting with people in real life and he doesn't have an example of what that looks like in his family. So all he's got is Corey. Right. That's it. Really. Kevin had previously considered himself an atheist, but when he heard Christina talk about her faith, he began talking about God and saying that he saw things differently. Corey says that Kevin told him, quote, if there is a God, he sees it in Christina. He had aspired to become a successful YouTuber as well, of course, in hopes of attracting Christina's attention. If he's on YouTube and he's got these followers, then maybe she'll give him a chance, right? It's an opportunity to get closer to her. So because, you know, to that end, 
Kevin tried to make himself more physically attractive for Christina by becoming vegan and losing 50 pounds, getting hair plugs, having dental procedures, and getting LASIK eye surgery. He hoped that these physical changes would help him be a more successful YouTuber so he could eventually meet his goal of getting Christina's attention. Hair plugs, dental work, LASIK eye surgery, three things that are physically so painful and so expensive and so just a long-term treatment, you know, plan where you got to go for multiple visits, multiple, you can't go out because your head's bleeding now and you've also got no teeth and you can't see. Like, the fuck? Yeah, this is working out your Best Buy insurance too, by the way, who's not covering these elective procedures. Right. Whoa. 100%. Correct. Yes, it's a lot. I mean, it's one thing for him to be like, okay, I'm going to get a haircut. Maybe I'll lose some weight or something. But no, he's really trying to completely reshape himself to become a person that he thinks is going to be more visually appealing on YouTube. Somebody's telling him constantly that he's ugly, by the way. He's taking that information in. Nothing else sticks. That sticks. I am unattractive. She won't want me. The other thing is, I can deal with, you get veneers. Okay, whatever. You need, you got laser eye surgery because you can't see. Okay, cool. I got you. The hair plugs is where I'm just like, red flag. <laughs> like, there's issues. He can't relate to people, human beings. He isolates. Why is he getting hair plugs? Right. If it's hard enough for you to even like talk to a girl in real life, why would you think that just getting procedures would help that? You know, maybe join some meetup groups and learn how to talk to people. He's really good at go to therapy. Maybe match.com. Right. Start there. There's online therapy. I mean, Jesus. Some look dig bald guys, dude. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's true. But it's also just like, it's a sign, you know, like, I don't want to shame people for whatever changes they want to make to their body because that's their choice. But also, it's clear that his motivation is to do it for outside reasons, for other people. You know, it's it's just, it's sad, you know? It's sad. That's and it, what it is. It is, is it, part it feels, of his obsession. It feels sad, Yeah. It's a, it's a byproduct of something bigger. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, it's just like I am all for anybody doing whatever they feel they need to do because it's not my body. It just isn't. Period. Like if you're happier, if you've got size H boobs, like go for it. Whatever you want to do. But when it really is about this desperation of needing to be a YouTube star and yeah. meeting Christina and all these other things, I mean, you don't need to get those procedures if you could really address those feelings in therapy, if you could address them by having more friends and talking about how you feel, you know? So, yeah, it's just not to shame him for any physical changes, but that's just the motivation is very sad, you know, and it just shows what a an emotional dark place he's in. He could have taken the insurance and gotten some therapy. Exactly. That's what's, you that know. That would have been covered. Damn it. Yeah. Kevin told Corey that Christina was his soulmate and he alluded to planning to be with her forever. When Corey told Kevin to be cautious about getting his hopes up about being with Christina, Kevin flipped out and said that if he wouldn't be supportive, then he couldn't be Corey's friend. Corey's never been so relieved in his life. He's like, oh, man, I've been stressing about taking care of you since we were 11. I don't have to be your friend anymore. (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's he's trying to really set him up. He's not even saying anything terrible. He's just saying, be realistic. Yeah. I'm not saying, no, it can't happen. I'm just saying, like, just stay grounded, be realistic, do the best, be the best you that you can be, and maybe you'll meet someone. Maybe don't make a rash decision. Right. Just continue like, doing what you're doing. Right. He was trying to be supportive by, you know, making sure that he stayed tethered to reality you could be supportive by saying, yeah, sure, you're going to marry Christina, but that's not most likely not the truth. So he's trying to be supportive by just being realistic, which is hard to do. 
I mean, it does. I personally, it takes guts to like kind of say something difficult yeah. to your friend and say, just slow your roll. Be realistic about this. Like it could be great or it could not. We don't know. Yeah. So that's a difficult conversation. And Kevin did not take it well. By 2016, his supervisor at Best Buy had moved him to only working in the back room where he wouldn't have to interact with customers. Oh, yeah. Something. Something went down. There was a there were multiple incidences. Incidents. For sure. Yes. Incidents yes. on the HR report. No doubt. While working in the back room, coworkers said that Kevin would often be listening to Christina or watching her videos on his phone. Coworkers had noticed that he seemed obsessive and would get defensive when asked about Christina. Although Corey and his coworkers knew about his infatuation with Christina Grimmie, Kevin's father Paul and brother Chris did not know anything anything about his obsession with the singer he never told them anything he came home he sat in a chair closed the door sat in the chair put his headphones on and played games that's it he didn't speak to anyone he didn't interact and side note this is like the millionth case where the co-workers the people that are catching on about the obsession to someone who either isn't real is a celebrity or is unattainable and the co-workers are the ones who have all the information and are coming together and saying, hey, did you hear this? Hey, he did this to me. And they're putting the stories together going, there is a problem with him. And I'm, I swear, like, it sounds crazy, but if you work somewhere and you're noticing and you're all comparing notes, say something, right. you, you really never know. This is not the first time we've heard this. Oh, yeah. It really happens and, Sorry, often. I just... No, it's true. We always say if you see something, say something. You've got a group of, like, 10 people. It, but, I mean, the ninja killer, Right. right? All the kids at the movie theater knew. Um, Dimebag, they all, everybody, you know, knew about this guy's obsession. It's just, and the anger and the feelings behind it, they all know. But it, because of the celebrity, it, it's never going to happen, right? Yeah, it's just really like you need to watch out for these signs. Obsessions. If someone's obsessed and unstable and exhibiting certain things, if you have to move someone to the night shift, you shouldn't be gossiping about it around the water cooler. There should be some real sort of intervention. You know what I mean? Or one of those people needs to go, hey, I, I got to tell somebody about this. <laughs> like right. bigger than what you think it is. Exactly. And I know that people, it's hard. People really want to keep to themselves and say, it's none of my business. He's just different. And I don't, you know, there's also an element of like, well, you don't want to be super judgy and just be like everyone that's different. We got to report. But use your logic. You know when an obsession has become this level of so unhealthy that someone's in danger. No one wants to be the heavy. But right. sometimes you got to say some shit sometimes. That it, just... it could really prevent violence. It could save someone's life. That's what it comes down to. And if you're wrong, later you can be like, remember when I thought Kevin was going to kill that girl? Oh, oh my God. Funny. I was out of my mind. Or what? <laughs> you know, but whatever. Yeah, it's just... It is definitely a situation where so many people noticed that something was wrong, but nothing was done. And again, again, I'll always bring it up. It's just like people need to be in therapy. Like there's plenty of times that coworkers or Corey or the family could have been like, we notice you're struggling. Let's get you to talk to someone, you know, like we support you. I'll go sit in the waiting room while you go have an appointment. You know, just it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm going to the police right this second and telling them you're obsessed with the pop star. Yeah, like, no. that's not what we're talking about. But when you see something going on with someone, encourage them to get help. You know, the help and the resources are out there, period. So, it, you know, even though they're difficult conversations to have, this conversation where the coworkers talk to him instead of each other could have saved lives. You know, that's what it comes down to. Geek Squad could have been the Detective Squad. Exactly. Shit. It's Mattress Firm's semi-annual sale. Right now, save up to $400 on our top-rated brands, like a Sealy Queen mattress that's now $399.99. Plus, take home a free adjustable base when you spend $699. At Mattress Firm, we make it easy to find the right bed for you. 
So hurry and visit mattressfirm.com or a store near you to save today. Your budget stretches further at Mattress Firm. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid to participate in locations only. For offer details, visit mattressfirm.com slash sale. It's Mattress Firm's semi-annual sale. Right now, save up to $400 on our top-rated brands, like a Sealy Queen mattress that's now $399.99. Plus, take home a free adjustable base when you spend $699. At Mattress Firm, we make it easy to find the right bed for you. So hurry and visit mattressfirm.com or a store near you to save today. Your budget stretches further at Mattress Firm. Offer valid with qualifying purchase. Restrictions apply. Valid to participate in locations only. For offer details, visit mattressfirm.com slash sale. Several weeks before the Plaza Live show in Orlando, Kevin went to two gun shops in St. Petersburg on May 25th and June 1st and attempted to purchase two handguns. After a five-day waiting period, he was able to legally buy two 9mm Glock handguns. The second gun was picked up only three days before Christina's Orlando show. Around this time, when Kevin saw Corey at work, he put his hand on Corey's shoulder and said, I love you, brother. He then told him he was, quote, tired and ready to ascend. And Corey, you know, kind of felt awkward and uncomfortable, like he didn't really get what was going on. So he tried to laugh it off and he was confused by the interaction, but he didn't really press the issue. He was just kind of like, eh, it's just Kevin being Kevin. Like, I love you too, brother. All right, cool. That was it. On June 9th, 2016, Kevin took a $200 taxi cab ride to the Orlando Marriott from his home in St. Petersburg, Florida. Kevin had not told anyone where he was going. He brought no luggage and only a few toiletries that he would need to get ready the next morning. The only other items that Kevin brought with him were two handguns, along with three boxes of bullets totaling 75 rounds and a large hunting knife. He checked in to room 643 and then came back downstairs to get some food. The next afternoon, Kevin's father became concerned that his son had not returned home, so he called Best Buy. I and mean, this is the guy that stays in his room. Like, he's home. If he's not at work, he's home. Right. So, like, he didn't come home. Who the fuck is he? Yeah. <laughs> right? If he's off by five minutes, like, you know his shift is away from people at certain hours. Like, if he's five minutes off, like, this is his routine. Something's wrong. Immediately, it's a red flag. The employees at Best Buy told Paul that Kevin was not at work. It had only been one day, and he was trying not to panic. But he was concerned about his son. It was definitely, you know, red flags going off just because this was not normal at all. A few hours later, Kevin attended Christina's show and stayed afterwards for the meet and greet. While fans were waiting for the stars to come out for autographs, Kevin leaned against the wall with his hands in his pockets of his black jeans. He pulled his black baseball cap down and nervously adjusted his red flannel shirt while he was waiting. Witnesses described Kevin as, quote, nervous and kind of creepy. What the other fans didn't know was that he was carrying two loaded guns concealed in his jeans and a large tactical knife strapped to his left ankle. When Kevin reached the front of the line, Christina immediately opened her arms to give him a hug. While she was preparing to embrace him, Kevin pulled out a 9mm Glock pistol and fired five shots at almost point-blank range. Christina was hit three times once in the head, and twice in the chest. 
People began panicking and running in all directions since some saw what had happened and others had no idea where the shots were coming from. I mean, it was just chaos. There was even this group of people that believed that there were balloons popping because it was the end of the show and there were earlier some balloons being popped while they were cleaning up the venue. So some people were just not startled at all, while others knew immediately, like, were in danger. I wouldn't even, like, I've thought this before in large groups of people or something, just standing there and my brain goes terrible places. Like, what if something happened right now? I mean, I uh, I can't even imagine, like, and all these shootings that we've had recently, like the mass shootings, and like, we know people now who we have been at these, the Vegas shootings, the Calabasas or Ogura Hills shootings, you know, we know these people, and it's like, I can't even imagine what goes through your brain, and then to be like, oh, it's balloons, and to think that you were totally fine and just standing there and like, could you know, oh, so many things, and she's just right. standing there ready to hug her fans, Exactly. It's so devastating. Senseless. That she was just so open and wanting to connect with her fans. And her first instinct was just, I hug every fan that comes up. But this one was just a dangerous person. She just didn't know. And all the other people around were just caught there in the confusion. It's just terrifying. As people were attempting to flee... Christina's brother, Marcus, tackled Kevin, and then the two men began to scuffle. Kevin broke free. He ran towards the wall in a panic and then pulled out a second gun. He put the gun to his head, pulled the trigger, and killed himself. Meanwhile, Christina was on the ground bleeding from the head, and a few people rushed to her side. Several others called 911 to report the shooting, and they told the 911 operators about the chaotic scene. When first responders arrived, an anonymous person was performing CPR on Christina. Kevin was on the floor with an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head, and he was pronounced dead at the scene. Christina, on the other hand, was treated by paramedics and rushed via ambulance to Orlando Regional Medical Center. She was in critical condition when she arrived and doctors attempted to save her, but Christina Grimmy was pronounced dead at 10.59 p.m. Many celebrities expressed their heartbreak and condolences on social media or they dedicated performances to her like Adam Levine, Justin Bieber, Demi Lovato, 21 Pilots, Blake Shelton, and a bunch more. The CEO of YouTube expressed shock and heartbreak, and the YouTube website paid tribute to her. Many of her fellow YouTubers also made tribute videos for Christina. When the news broke, a couple people who were Best Buy co-workers, said they instantly feared that Kevin might be involved. This is what I'm talking about. How? They don't even know. Like, they might be on their day off, right? And they're just hanging out, and they just see on the news, oh, Christina Grimmie's been shot. And they're just immediately, where's Kevin? This is someone that should have said, you know, like, okay, you knew the fact that if there's violence, you already put him with this. There's bigger things going on. You know, if you know somebody who, for example, if you heard Eddie Van Halen has been injured, you're like, oh, my God, where's Tom? We have bigger issues here. Tom should have been talked about much sooner. Exactly. If your first thought is to know that someone who's close to you did this, then... Or even to wonder if it's possible. Right. That is... Whoa. Then you knew enough red flags to intervene earlier. We right? are not blaming these people. No, we it's are not their dialogue, fault, but just <laughs> saying like it's important to really keep that in mind yeah. in our own lives. Yes. You know what I mean? Like that's why I say these things out loud is to Same. just be like, look, I need to remember that like if something is wrong, I have to trust my guts. These people had that feeling in their gut 
that he was a danger to Christina, right? Yeah. So when something happened to her, if they immediately thought he did it, you have to think, what would the world be like if they had intervened and said, look, we think that your fascination or obsession with her is really hurting you, is not healthy. Let's get you some help. You know what I mean? Like, the course of history could have been changed. And that's what I try and tell myself in my own life, you know, in a lot of ways, in a lot of respects, that we have a lot of control and power over how things turn out by just being loving and empathetic and supportive of each other. You know what I mean? This is one of those situations where someone could have been there for him. Someone could have done that loving act of saying like, hey, I know this conversation is difficult, but... I don't want to read about you on the news. So let's get you some help. You know? Exactly. So even though some of his coworkers immediately suspected him, the flip side of that is his best friend Corey's first reaction was to worry about Kevin and think that his best friend was just going to be completely heartbroken when he heard the news of Christina's passing. Makes me question his sanity, but it also makes me think that he really, like his sanity that he's taken care of Kevin since they were 11 and is just worried that he's going to be heartbroken. But then it also makes me think that he really just did not think of him as a threat. Right. At he all. He really believed that he wasn't that kind he's of a fan. person. Yeah. Because he was so close to him, it's like, yeah, I see how it's unhealthy or obsessive, but I don't see him having that kind of character that's violent. You know, I think it says more that, you know, about their relationship and that he believed and trusted his friend was a good person, you know? Yeah. Detectives went to St. Petersburg to investigate Kevin Loibel and search his home and devices for more information about his motive. Kevin's phone had been encrypted, which prevented police from getting any information. And he had destroyed the hard drive of his computer before heading to Orlando. It was only through interviewing people that that knew him that detectives were able to determine that Kevin had a, quote, unhealthy and unrealistic infatuation with Christina. Even though his friends and coworkers knew about Kevin's obsession, His father and brother, again, said that he never talked to them about Christina. They had no idea. His family was also not aware that Kevin had bought guns or that he made any plans to travel to Orlando. So again, I mean, the people that are the closest to him or that know the most about him are probably his coworkers. He's not talking to his family. They really know nothing. He's shut them out. He's completely separated from them. He doesn't seem to like them. No. Honestly. And like there's clearly no interaction in the household. And I think that to me speaks volumes about maybe just not feeling safe from a young age. So if you don't feel safe physically or emotionally from very early childhood why would you talk to your family members? If you've never felt safe in that home, why would you feel safe to let your guard down and say, look, I'm really into this thing, or this is my hobby that I love, or this is, you don't talk to people about like intimate subjects if you don't feel safe with them. Yeah. And coming from an abusive home where he never felt safe, I mean, it just only makes sense. He's not going to talk to them. He just doesn't really seem like a communicator. That too. Yeah. But at least like his fellow employees at Best Buy knew, you know, like you may not be a communicator, but, you know, I wonder more than his family when he was working at Best Buy. It was around the time when she was making all these videos. She's becoming really famous. It's possible that like they played the voice in the store a lot, you know, or like ads and stuff for YouTube, because I remember working at a red logoed Target. And when I did this, (laughs) it was 
always like the Adele hello song played again and again next to the men's department, right? And it was like, oh, you okay, have the voice whether, of an angel. whether I want to hear it or not, here I am, right? Right. And so maybe it's like he would hear and it would start a conversation. And that's how they knew uh, because he doesn't seem like a talkative guy. So somebody opens the door or something opens the door to this discussion. Well, I mean, the voice was a huge show at the time. It's probably that. Yeah, I mean, maybe he had seen that or the ads were playing or anything like Something that. Something like that. But no, he was in the back playing her stuff all the time, which is how the subject was coming you up. You walk by, hey, what are you listening to? Exactly. And every time it's Party in the USA by Christina, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that seemed to be the case. And he was a little bit guarded about it, too. People would say, like, he would sometimes get defensive and he felt like people were judging him. You could tell that kind of stuff. He didn't really want to talk about it. He'd say it was Christina, but then that was where it ended, you know? But um, people knew. They knew. The very next day after Christina was murdered, the Pulse nightclub shooting happened. And it was only about four miles away from where she was shot. The news cycle immediately was just taken over by the Pulse tragedy and trying to just make sense of these 49 people that lost their lives in this mass shooting. It's so bizarre. It's so close. The timing, it's, it's so unbelievable. Christina's murder was largely overshadowed and forgotten in the wake of this mass shooting since you know, the Pulse tragedy was so shocking and heartbreaking that, you know, the event claimed so many lives that nobody was really talking about the one person that died the night before, you know? And it's, you know, it's hard to just be like, oh, one thing is more important than the other. But it's just important to point out a lot of people don't remember even about Christina's passing because immediately... Nobody was talking about it. You sit back and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, I do remember that. Like, okay, that happened. But wait, why wasn't that a bigger story? You know what I mean? Like, wait, why don't I know more about that? And then you find out, oh, okay, it's like September 11th. You know, anything that happened on the 10th, we don't remember. This is, I mean, really my first thought when I started looking at this case was I so vividly remember that this happened And also know nothing about it. Same. Exact same here. Because it was just like, yes, this thing happened. But then the very next day, the entire focus was shifted somewhere else. And somewhere that was, I mean, deeply emotionally disturbing to me. And of course, that was all I could think about was Pulse, you know, Um, and being an attack on the community that I'm a part of. I mean, it was just heartbreaking and devastating. But I knew that the Christina Grimmy murder had happened. I just knew nothing about it because nobody was reporting on it. Once she passed away and then Pulse happened, that was kind of the end of talking about Christina. So yeah, this was an opportunity to really look into her life and and really, yeah, get to know her a little bit better. On June 11th, Christina's manager created a GoFundMe to help the Grimmy family pay for funeral expenses. Although the goal was $4,000, the GoFundMe ended up raising over $170,000 in just two days. That's amazing to me. It's a lot. The family held a private funeral on June 16th, and she was buried at Berlin Cemetery. On June 17th, a public memorial was held in Medford, New Jersey, for thousands of Christina's friends and fans. That same day, Christina's YouTube channel posted a montage video titled In Loving Memory of Christina Grimmy," and within four days, the video received 2.5 million views and 33,000 comments. The Loibel family left a handwritten note on the doorstep of the Grimmy home. The note apologized and offered condolences, saying, quote, deepest sorrows for the loss to the family, friends, and fans of the very talented, loving Christina Grimmy. 
You have to do something, right? You can't just say nothing because then you're the insensitive family of that asshole. But, but we don't hear that in every story. No. So, I mean, it is kind of a big deal that they reached out and yeah. offered their support, you know. It's usually like they don't talk about it. Right. And you know that they've they've said something to the family, but they don't leave a handwritten note like that. And it's also like you're going through your own loss. They lost their, you know, son, brother. So, I mean, it's hard to even put yourself in that position to think about someone else's pain when you're just like completely devastated by this loss. So I don't know. I mean, none of us can judge what it's like when someone's going through that grieving process, but it is, you know, really kind of them to really reach out like that. The Christina Grimmie Animal Fund was created in her honor, and she posthumously won the Impact Award for her animal rights activism. Six months after the murder, in December 2016, the Grimmy family filed a wrongful death lawsuit naming the concert promoter, the foundation that owns the venue, and the security company working the event as liable for Christina's death. A month later, the entities named in the suit requested that the judge dismiss the lawsuit because Florida law does not hold business owners liable for attacks committed on their property. The lawsuit was eventually dismissed. On April 9, 2018, the Grimmie family filed a new lawsuit, which the judge allowed to move forward. In this lawsuit, the Grimmie family alleged that the defendants, quote, failed to take adequate security measures to ensure the safety of the performers and the attendees at the concert venue. The Grimmie family also cited, quote, negligent infliction of emotional distress for their survivors and especially for Christina's older brother, Marcus. The judge determined more research was required to substantiate the claims, but there has been no update on a deadline for the research or when a decision should be expected. On September 2nd, 2018, Christina's mother, Tina, died at the age of 59 after multiple battles with breast cancer. Both Christina's death and the Pulse nightclub mass shooting reignited the conversation about gun violence and mental health. But of course, just like always happens in these cases, there weren't any substantial changes that arose from the violent weekend in Orlando. You mean the tweets saying thoughts and prayers didn't do anything? Nope, not at all. Really? That's crazy. It's just every single time something like this happens, we just go through the conversation again. Everyone battles it out and gets their comments and the trolls come out and then nothing happens legally. And I always love re reporting on a, a case where something did happen, where laws did change, where something was influenced. And maybe there will be an update where more security will be required at venues because of this lawsuit that's still pending. Maybe. But, I mean, it's just all too often we don't hear any changes or any substantial improvements after a huge loss like this. So that's the story of Christina Grimmie. Bummer. It's just devastating. It's just senseless, man. It's like... All of these shootings Everything. are, right? I know, but... And, you know, it's really... We see all these cases that are of different natures because we go through all sorts of cases on Murder Dictionary and explore all sorts of subjects. And there's, you know, every one of them is tragic and heartbreaking. But when there's these shootings and you know that just anonymous people are in danger, like had her brother not tackled him, the amount of casualties could have been catastrophic. I mean, he brought 75 rounds with him. Had there not been, you know, a, a person that could jump in and overpower him and really get everyone safe right away, there would have been way more loss that day. And so it's just, 
I just think of these sort of shootings, these anonymous things, these mass shootings as just the ultimate, just baffling tragedies. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. And obsession in general, too. Like, if you love someone, right, you're obsessed with them, like, it doesn't make sense. There's so, it's so hard for me to understand the psychology of this, you know? The ones, too, where it's like, you're paying to go see someone you like. You enjoy this. So why do you want to inflict pain and anger on something you enjoy? Right. Like, save that for people you hate, right? And I know there is the psychology to it of like, if I can't have this person, nobody can have them. And often there is an element of disappointment. Like if a stalker or an obsessive fan does attack someone, there is this psychological component to it where there's a disappointment. So let's say that the person that the fan is obsessed with gets into a new relationship. Yes. Or does something in the media and the press that they deem, you know, um, I don't unsavory Rebecca or embarrassing. Rebecca Schaefer did a sex scene, and that is why Robert John Bardo came after her, was because he was upset because she had the little girl image. She was a good girl, and then she did that movie, a Thoughts of a Clash scene in Beverly Hills or whatever that movie's called, where she did a love scene, and that is what he said upset her, upset him, that like set him off, that he needed to go stalk her, find her, and then shoot her on her front porch when she opened the door. This is the perfect example. Same thing. That's often what the psychology is yeah. behind this. But because he had erased his or, you know, ru ruined, completely yeah. destroyed his computer and phone. I mean, we really have no insight into this. But it's safe to assume that the psychology of these sort of attacks is usually based on disappointment and hurt and like holding them up on this pedestal and then having that kind of crumble. There's got to be something that happened that we'll never know that he felt like, oh, well, whatever. And, you know, of course, women are held to some completely ridiculous standards. So it could have been something as silly as like she posted a shot of her in a bikini on one of her YouTube videos or something, you know, like yeah. something completely innocuous that just doesn't matter. And this obsessed fan took that as just an embarrassment or a slight on her clean image. You know, whatever it was, something happened that he just felt like that's done. She was over in his eyes. Yeah. So it, it's just we'll never know what it is. And it's so senseless and sad. But we just don't have those answers. So that's Christina Grimmy, M for music on bummer, Murder Dictionary. Man. Just such a bummer. I know. I'm, I'm super bummed out. All right. We need to get snacks or something that'll make us perk right. up. Because, we need some geez. cheering up after yeah. this. What a bummer. So, yeah, before we get out of here, uh, if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which is a great place to cheer up because we do have a ton of memes. That's true. We do have a pretty fun and funny social media presence. So definitely check us out, uh, Murder Dictionary, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want merch, check out our Threadless and the links for that and our Patreon are in the show notes along with our research material and some links for mental health and all sorts of stuff. So if you see your coworker and you're like, I need to recommend therapy, check out the links in our show notes. Maybe you should talk to someone, dude. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it's just an idea. <laughs> and before we get out of here, we just want to say thank you to the new patrons on our Patreon, Sarah, Kate, Bristol, and Amanda. Thank you. So if you want to be on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Murder Dictionary Podcast, you will get bonus episodes and ad-free episodes and just extra content on there. So check it out in the link in our show notes if you want to join. And I think with that, we can get out of here and go get some comfort food and cheer ourselves up. Cheesy, crunchy, salty. Yes. That's what I need. Most definitely. All right. We'll see you next week with another case. We hope you have a good one. And thanks for listening. See ya. Bye.